So the goal in this lab is for you to identify six different unknown solutions. So you know what they're going to be. You know you're going to have potassium chromate, aluminum chloride, sodium carbonate, lead to nitrate, sodium acetate, and copper to sulfate. But you don't know which one's which. They're simply, the solutions are simply labeled with one through six. Now a couple of key hints for helping you to do this. What I would do before you actually do this lab, and this is going to be in the pre-lab, two of these solutions are going to be colorful. So what I would do is look up each of these compounds and figure out in solution which of these are colorful. So you'll have already identified at least two solutions before you even start the lab. Then what you should do is consider some solubility rules. So for example, if you look at these compounds, which of these compounds, both the metal and the non-metal, the cation and the anion, will always be soluble? So for example, if we look at aluminum chloride, Aluminum, we don't really know the rules for that, but let's say it's mostly soluble. Chloride tends to be soluble, except there are going to be a couple of exceptions. So that doesn't really help us. But if you look, remember the rules for solubility that you have to memorize are that your group 1A metals, your alkali metals, are always going to be soluble when they're in a compound. Nitrate is always soluble. And acetate is always soluble. So if you look at this list, sodium acetate will always be soluble. So as soon as you complete this lab and see one compound that was always soluble, right, when it was combined with another compound, no matter what, it was always soluble, you know you have sodium acetate. So it's these kind of tricks and using your double replacement net ionic reactions, you'll use these in order to determine the identity of all six solutions. So let's look at some pre-lab questions. Okay. So the first question that you need to answer is, can you identify any of these based on color? So you need to look up the solutions and see if any of them are colorful, any of these compounds in solution are colorful. Okay. Then you need to explain why they are colorful. So you don't get to just to say, oh, this compound in solution is colorful. Why? Okay. Hint, you're going to have to look this up okay, and provide your explanation below. Okay. In three, I say, if I had given you these compounds in the solid form and you had combined them, no reaction would have occurred. Explain on the molecular level why reactions occur very quickly in aqueous solution compared to the reaction of two solids. So if you don't know this, why our, why our compounds need to be aqueous, then look that up as well. So what you need to do before you actually complete the lab is you need to write out the net ionic equations for all of the reactions that could potentially occur, right? So you have six different compounds that are going to be combined, okay? So for example, you would have your number one and two, one and three, one and four, one and five, one and six, two and three, two and four. So we need to know each of these compounds combined with each other what the net ionic reaction would be. So I'm going to show you one example. Now, if you do not have a precipitate form, that means no reaction is going to occur. And you would write that when you're completing these net ionic equations. So I'm going to combine potassium chromate and aluminum chloride. Okay, So potassium chromate would be K2CrO4. It's going to react with aluminum chloride. And it's going to produce, remember, innies and outies. So it's going to produce potassium chloride and aluminum chromate. I crossed my charges. Before I do anything, I need to make sure that I balance. So so I've got two aluminums on my product side, so I'm going to put a two there. Notice I've got three chromates, so I need to put a three in front of potassium chromate, and then I need six potassium chlorides. Now anything that is soluble, I'm going to break up. So potassium chromate is going to be soluble because everything with a group one metal is soluble, so that's going to be six K pluses plus three chromates. And aluminum chloride, again, is going to be soluble because there are only a couple exceptions for chloride, so I'm going to have two aluminum ions six chloride ions. Potassium chloride is always soluble, so it's going to be six potassiums and six chlorides. And then aluminum chromate. Chromate has very similar solubility rules as carbonate does, so we're going to assume that this is going to be insoluble. Now on the AP they would tell you, just for you to know, except for the, you know, the general so always soluble ones. Okay, so anything that's the same I'm going to cross out, and so what I get for my net ionic is three chromates, Two aluminum ions produces aluminum chromate. Notice my potassium and my chloride were spectator ions. So this is my net ionic equation. So you're going to be writing these out for a number of them. If you don't want to write the first two reactions that I wrote above, because you can do this in your head 
being able to see what the precipitate is, and then knowing what the reactants are going to be, I only need the net ionic equation. All right. Now, if aluminum chromate were soluble, then there would be no reaction here because no precipitate forms. Okay, so in this lab, I'm about to show you my procedure for actually doing the drops, but what the instructions tell you to do is to take four drops of each solution and mix them in a test tube, okay? So if you notice, for example, I'm going to take first solution one and solution two. I'm going to take four drops of solution one and add four drops of solution two to it in a little test tube. If you see a precipitate, you're going to mark it in the where one and two come together. If it doesn't, then you'll write no precipitate. So I'll, I'll show you that in just one second. The one thing I want to let you know, in the interest of time, what you can do, for example, when you're testing number one, you could get five test tubes in a row, add four drops of one to each, to all of them, and then individually add two, then three, then four, then five, then six, just to save some time, if you're interested, because you're going to be doing a lot of reactions here. So in this laboratory experiment, you're going to be doing a number of different reactions, so I'm just going to show you one of them. So one thing that I wanted to point out, two of the solutions you'll be given are going to be very distinctive colors. So even before you begin this lab, you should be able to figure out what they are, and that will help you in identifying the four other solutions, because you're going to have a total of six. Now the actual procedure that you're going to do for each of these, I'm going to just take two solutions. So I've got these two right here. Okay. And I'm just going to add four drops of each of them into my little test tube right here, okay? So I'm going to do one, two, three, four drops there, okay? And then I'm going to have four drops of my other compound, okay? One, two, three, four, okay? So I'm going to mix it, and I'm going to make any observations. Now, if you look... I'm trying to see here, I don't see any precipitate form, okay? So what I would write on my chart would be no precipitate. Now, if I think maybe I see something, but I'm not 100% sure, and you don't want to rule anything out, then you can write potential precipitate. Most of the precipitates in this lab are going to be very obvious, though. So you'll be able to see a white solid, or you'll be able to see something form. All right, so this is just one of the many different reactions you're going to do. So you might want to line up all of your test tubes and for example, put all drops of, for example, number one, four drops in each test tube, and then go in a line and do the second one, the third one, the fourth one, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do it that way. Honestly, there's no wrong way to do it. But this is what you're going to be doing, creating solutions, looking at them, making observations, and then putting it into your table. And that's it. So for this post-lab analysis, what we did before was qualitative analysis, where we looked at, does a precipitate form, does it not, in order to identify the identity of solutions. What you're going to be doing in this post-lab analysis is quantitative analysis, so actually measuring the mass of the precipitate that is formed. And this is called gravimetric analysis. So in this problem, it gives you the mass of the filter paper, the mass of the filter paper and the precipitate after it's been dried one time, then after it's been dried two times, and then after the third drying. Notice that the mass continues to go down until, notice it barely changes between the second and third drying, which tells us that we've gotten rid of all of the water at that point. And so this problem is a gravimetric analysis problem, which you're going to be doing. I'm not going to walk you through it. You guys are perfectly capable of figuring it out. But I did want to note how this is different from what we did in the lab, simply because we were looking qualitatively at work, and now this is quantitative analysis with gravimetric analysis.